Hello, Internet people. Just a quick one for you today. I have this Kenwood KX40 that had a little recording issue. So today, we're gonna go over the very quick and easy fix that I did, and then I'll show you the ins and outs of this simple but respectable little cassette deck. So stick around because I actually get to show you some hands-on stuff today. So this is the Kenwood KX40. It had a little issue when I tried to record, and that's that it wouldn't. The record key would move, but it wouldn't actually do anything. In fact, it wouldn't even stay down. So I was hoping that it was just something stupid and mechanical, which I think I can actually fix since that's usually kind of easy. The record key is linked to a little tab on the top of the tape transport. Like I showed in the last video, that indexes to a little hole in the top of the cassette. The way that it works, at least in this case, is actually pretty simple. It's just a little plastic lever on a spring that either obstructs the record lever or it lets it move. So since that worked fine, I looked a little bit farther down and saw that when I pressed on the key, it pulled this spring, but the metal lever that it's hooked to didn't want to move at all thanks to some very, very sticky old grease. If you look under the panel on the bottom, you can see this little rod right here is clipped to the switch that turns the recording circuitry on and off. By the way, those long switches get oxidized pretty often, so I always hit them with contact cleaner every time I open up a new machine, just in case. But anyway, if I moved the little metal arm thing manually, the record light would come on. So that meant there was a good chance it would work if I just got it moving properly. There's a little snap ring that has to come off very carefully so it doesn't pull a Bilbo Baggins and disappear on you. Then the connecting rod at the back and the little spring that couples it to the record key have to come off. After that, I had to work that little lever off of the hinge pivot. It was really stuck. That grease was like glue. Then I just sat and cleaned the lever up with isopropyl alcohol on a paper towel for most of it. And then I used these really cool little foam tip swabs to get all the small spots. I also cleaned the snap ring because that was really sticky too. Then I made sure to clean the pivot thoroughly and then dry everything off because the alcohol has a little bit of water in it. Then I just stuck the lever back on and failed and failed and failed several times to get the spring back on before finally getting it back in place. I was once again very glad I had that little pair of hemostats that our piercer gave me. Then I just reattached the snap ring and I was good. However, I did oil it lightly. I started actually recently using gun oil because it's really good about not gumming up and it's kind of meant for stuff that's gonna sit idle for long periods of time, which is nice. Anyway, I gave it a quick test and sure enough, everything worked. The light came on, the keys stayed down, and we were good to go. The record level pot was a little bit crackly and was cutting out a tiny bit, so I hit that with contact cleaner and worked it back and forth a little, which effectively fixed the problem for now. Just to make sure that everything was right, I let the machine sit powered on, which runs the motor. So I just let it spin for a while. After about 15 minutes or so, the motor started clicking, which I unfortunately forgot to record, but I carefully oiled it too and ran it until it quieted down. It actually seems to run great now. It's nice and quiet. It's one more example of why I love rescuing components from thrift stores whenever I can, even if they're not high end. The whole repair process only took about 20 minutes, and that was mostly because I was fiddling with the camera trying to film it, and that one spring. But now it actually works great. So let's look at what it actually does, yeah? Before I show it off though, I wanna clarify something that maybe I haven't properly articulated. This is not a premium deck, but I'm showing it for a reason. I think lower end gear is perfectly fine if it does the job. That's kind of the whole point of this channel. It's thrifted gear. I only show you the stuff that I happen to find at thrift stores and estate sales. They're a gamble when it comes to quality. It might be great, it might be cheap. You never know. I choose not to go online and seek out specific pieces of equipment because that's not something first timers are doing usually. If you only have a couple of tapes or records and you just want to try to play them, it's silly to go online and spend hundreds of dollars on a premium piece of equipment just to find out what your dad recorded on an old tape back in his college football days. You don't need to spend a whole paycheck just to find out that he loved golden earring. That's why I demo the things that I demo. It's to show what's possible on a budget with little to no experience. This is meant to be as inclusive as possible to folks who are just starting out. Now, that said, let's actually take a look at this thing. As I said before, this is the Kenwood KX40 stereo cassette deck. 
It's a two head machine and it doesn't have a lot of features, but it does have a couple of unusual quirks that I've never seen before and a surprisingly good sound for a cassette player that only retailed for $185 in 1981, which is not bad considering the Denon DRM44 from the last video was more than two and a half times as much just a couple of years later. You have a big power button on the left and when it comes on, the only light you have is the single red power LED. The transport controls are the heavy piano key style levers that raise and lower the heads and the pinch roller. Next to those, you have a timer standby key, which seems to just allow the machine to spool up before it starts recording or playing when you operate it with a timer. If anybody has any more details on the timer key, I invite you to share and I'll pin your comments so that everybody can see it. You have only one Dolby setting, which would make it Dolby B. Dolby C was in development at the same time that this deck was, and they both appeared at about the same time. However, as with any new technology, it took companies a little bit of time to adopt it, so just having B when this came out was still adequate for its target demographic. The tape type selector seems a little bit confusing because it only gives you the option for normal and metal. Those are usually referring to tape types 1 and 4 respectively. So that begs the question, what do you do with types 2 and 3? Opinions online seem to disagree a little bit, but the dominant one, and the one I seem to agree with, was that type 1 tape should use the normal setting and everything else should be on metal. I checked on that though just by doing a couple of test recordings and to my admittedly partially deaf ears, that did seem right. However, don't take my word on that because I've been to too many concerts without earplugs. Yeah. There are three ports on the front. One quarter inch headphone jack that only outputs a set volume and a pair of stereo quarter inch microphone inputs. As we've seen with other machines, plugging a microphone into one of the ports overrides the input signal coming from the back so that both cannot overlap. Now, I'm sure this comes as a huge shocker, but playing a tape works like any other machine that I've shown. Open the cassette door, pop the tape in, close it and press play. However, that brings me to a quirk that I thought was interesting. When you pop open the cassette door, there's a rudimentary dampening system, but it's not like the typical linear or rotary dampers that we usually find. So let's pull it back open and have a look at that. The damper is up here on the top. They've actually used a tiny little flywheel with a string wrapped around it to slow the motion of the cassette door. I will say that the term slow is kind of a stretch since it still opens pretty aggressively, but it's an interesting idea that I, at least myself, have never encountered before. When you play a tape, the peak level meters will dance. They're made of seven LED lights each, four green and three red. When you're recording, these will show you your input levels, allowing you to adjust them with the large knob on the far right. That is only a single pot, so you cannot adjust the left and right inputs separately. Hopefully, whatever you have going into the machine is already balanced. This being a two head machine, you have to trust the level lights and your own intuition that your recording level is good. You can hear the input signal through the tape monitor function on your amp, but that's not the actual recording on the tape. It's just the input signal. So before you actually make a mixtape or dub for the first time on a deck like this, I would highly encourage you to run a few test recordings and play them back just to get a feel for how the recordings sound relative to the input signal, because often it's a little bit different and you'll probably have to tweak it a bit. This is definitely a get a feel for it type of machine. Let's flip it around and check out the back panel. The most notable thing back here is the fact that the cables are hardwired to the machine. There are no RCA jacks, so the length of cable that you get is what you have. Usually, that's not much of an issue if you're stacking everything, but the cords are only three feet long, and that can be a problem sometimes if you have to route them through stereo cabinets or anything like that. You can buy little couplers to add an additional RCA cord to make it longer if you need to, but that's something that you'd have to do on your own. But yeah, that's the Kenwood KX40 Stereo Cassette Deck. It's a pretty basic machine, but it definitely sounds nice considering it's not at all a premium deck. I'm a bit surprised I was able to get it working considering I only started this channel a little over a year ago and I knew absolutely nothing about old stereo equipment at the time. This has been a roller coaster of a journey for me and I'm starting to get a little bit more comfortable diagnosing and fixing stuff so maybe I can actually do a couple of repair videos in the future. Fingers crossed. We'll see. If nothing else, you might get to watch me blow myself up and that's always entertaining, right? So thank you for watching. I'll see you guys again soon and as always, stay metal.